Live from our seven Tasmania studios, your nightly news with Kim Miller begins now. Good evening everyone. First tonight, a coroner has found the deaths of two miners at Queenstown in 2013 were entirely avoidable. Three men were killed in two separate tragedies at the Mount Lyle mine, with a coroner saying their deaths robbed the community. Fathers, husbands and sons. Eight years ago, two separate tragedies took three men from the Queenstown community. In December 2013, Craig Gleason, aged 45, and Alastair Lucas, aged 25, died at the Lyle mine. Just six weeks later, 53-year-old Michael Welsh died on the same site. Today, their families were finally given closure. Coroner Simon Cooper finding the deaths of Mr Gleason and Mr Lucas were entirely avoidable, saying they'd been standing on a temporary platform made of soft wood. A piece of heavy machinery struck it, sending the pair plummeting to their deaths. Noting if a properly engineered platform was available, it's highly unlikely they would have died. Copper Mines Tasmania was fined over the deaths in 2016. The coroner making a series of recommendations, including there be no further use of temporary platforms. The company currently in the process of selling the mine. It says the learnings from the report will be implemented before a proposed restart. It has been a, a very important concern uh, and high, high level of concern for the local community over a long period of time, uh, particularly for the families affected, and of course we'll look at that report very carefully. In the case of Michael Welsh, his loader was engulfed by a mud rush. The coroner saying the response was timely and nothing more could have been done after the incident. His family leaving court in tears. Simon Cooper capturing the pain felt by so many. Their deaths robbed the community of three important members. Many people lost a friend, teammate or co-worker. They were very much part of that proud and resilient community. A community that must now carry on with part of it still missing. Meg Sides, 7 Tasmania News. Police have announced they have located the weapon they believe was used in a murder on Tuesday morning this week. 23-year-old Gabrielle Marshall was allegedly stabbed in her bed by Colin William Drake, who faced court on a charge of murder yesterday. Police have spent three days searching for the weapon and studying the scene. It comes as Alberston residents organise a candlelight vigil for the young mother to be held on Sunday evening. The Premier has denied the state government has failed animal welfare standards after right to information documents point to severe mistreatment of seals by TASAL. Environment Tasmania claims ongoing abuses are happening because of a lack of oversight by the Tasmanian government. Look, in terms of that, um, you know, I know that we have very strong regulations in place. A spokesperson for TASAL has said occasional wildlife interactions do occur and the company is committed to complying with regulations. Residents in one of Tasmania's most eye-catching destinations could be stumped with an eye-watering rate rise. The Glamorgan Spring Bay Council is proposing a 15% increase over the next two years, then at 12.5% for one year. The council admits its balances are very low and borrowings are at maximum capacity. The proposal will be taken to a vote next week. Dark Mofo is in full swing with border closures and bad weather doing little to keep the crowds away. Our reporter Meg Sides has managed to claim her spot inside Winter Feast and she joins us now. Good evening Meg. It is looking busy in there tonight. Kim, it is starting to fill up down here well and truly as you can see behind me and the Winter Feast is looking as spectacular as usual. Now there are more than 80 stalls down here this year and performances expected throughout the evening. The advice is to get in early if you want to grab a spot. Now earlier today we had a sneak preview of another festival favourite, the Ogger Ogger. This year it takes the form of a giant stag beetle from Bruni Island named Fifi. Throughout the event hunters will be able to write down their fears and throw them into the Ogger Ogger before the structure is set alight. And then to see them burnt, there's this ritualistic feeling of them being done with. And we do it at this time of the year because obviously on the solstice it's just about to become lighter. That burning will take place in a ceremony on Sunday evening and Kim, as the festival continues, there are still rumours swirling about whether the Winter Feast will be extended to allow for more interstate visitors to attend. But for now, I reckon our evening will consist of a bit of taste testing. You enjoy it. Thanks very much, Meg. Tough job you've got.
the Tasmanian dairy industry admits it could be facing a future crisis as the struggle continues to attract young faces to the workforce. But that hasn't dulled the confidence of farmers who are basking in a year of record high milk production, tipping towards a billion dollars. For the state's dairy farmers, the outlook is as green as the grass itself. The confidence is so high. Charged by a year of strong rainfall and booming cow numbers, the industry churned out a record-breaking 950 million litres of milk last year, enough to fill an Olympic swimming pool 380 times. This year we're approaching either the record or near record levels again. In 12 months, milk production jumped by nearly 2% and is climbing. Now Tasmania is closing in on the country's second largest dairy state, New South Wales. I've never seen our industry so buoyant and so excited about the future. But it's getting the future excited about dairying, which remains perhaps the biggest challenge. The sector concedes it's dealing with an ageing farming population. And that's one of the reasons why our association is very keen to start closing that gap and bringing younger people up. New education programs are hoping to shift some perceptions. Whether the industry is sexy enough to want to be in. The state government today reiterating its support, milking an eight-month-old funding commitment for two new research farms. The seven million from last year is the same funding that we've uh, announced today. But with a fresh twist, an extra two million poured in by UTAS. Garth Burley, 7 Tasmanian News. Tasmanian boat builder Incat will soon receive a $100 million loan from the taxpayer to help build a new catamaran. The state government says it's living up to its election promise to back jobs at the business. While no buyer has stepped forward for the boat, they're confident one will eventually be found. Incat bought a proposition to the government to say if you'll help us to build this boat um, we can be ready when the market comes back to life. It shouldn't escape people's attention that we've sold about 100 in the past. Uh, so the next 100 uh, the challenge. The loan is expected to secure around 500 jobs. And from spurring on the Sandy Bay Seagulls to reaching the heights of the AFL, Queenstown's Chris Fagan will tomorrow mark his 100th game as coach of the Brisbane Lions. Arriving in Hobart for the match against the Kangaroos, Fagan says he's had a lot of help from Tasmanians along the way. The footy gods have been kind to Chris Fagan, gifting him a family-friendly feeling for his milestone match. My mum just lives along the road, so uh, uh, it's something that she didn't expect to be able to do. Fagan's rise has been steady and successful. A champion player in the 80s. Grab here by Fagan. Fagan, a quick snapshot. He would go from North Hobart assistant to senior coach at Sandy Bay before taking over the Tassie Mariners, elevating the former school teacher into football full time. His AFL breakthrough came via Melbourne and Hawthorne before Brisbane bestowed coaching's holy grail on Fagan in 2017. And their best football is ahead of them. He thinks the same about David Noble's Kangaroos, despite the draw to GWS. What I've noticed about their team is they're getting better as the year goes by. So, uh, you know, uh, the Giants are a pretty good outfit. And, uh, you know, in the end, probably North a little bit unlucky to lose. They were, they were the better team last week. Mitch Robinson's lucky not to be dropped after dropping the coach yesterday. Actually, I wasn't ready for him to do that. And uh, as with Robbo, you never know what he's going to do. And for the trivia buffs, tomorrow will be Fagan's first time coaching the Lions in Hobart, having overseen three matches in Launceston. Tom Johnson, 7 Tasmania News. Driving, firearms and bookwork. There's a lot to squeeze in during eight months of training at the Tasmania Police Academy. Today, 27 new constables threw their hats in the air as they prepare for life on the thin blue line. After eight gruelling months of training, these new recruits are marching on to the job. Ceremony and tradition are the hallmarks of police graduations, but eventually you can let your hair down. I'm stoked, I'm so glad. It's been a tricky long eight months, but we're at the end and so excited to go and start my new career. For some, it's their first career. For others, it's the next step. I'm fortunate enough, I used to be in the Navy, so I had a pretty good idea of what was going to happen. Um, so, yeah, it was, look, it was tough at times, and there were certainly moments where it definitely challenges you. As for the academy highlights, well, you can probably guess. Uh, driver training was probably, I, I reckon a lot of people would say that was their favourite week. 
27 new officers joined the force today. They've worked very hard. Um, it's, uh, it's long days. They start quite early in the morning with their physical training. Um, it, the, the academic side of things is quite demanding. 13 officers will head to Launceston, while the rest will go to Hobart, Glenorchy, Burnie and Devonport. And if you're thinking of joining the force, perhaps hit the gym first. Just do it. Just give it a crack. Get your physical fitness really good. Um, apply and see what happens. Sean McComish, 7 Tasmania News. Fishing, camping and boating facilities around Tasmania are set to be given a boost. 19 projects in the state, including toilet blocks, barbecues and boat ramps, are being funded under a federal government grants program. To ensure that Tasmanians and those visitors to our state can actually enjoy what is so special about our wonderful community, and that is the great outdoors. This particular project for us will be to enhance the uh, Clarence kayak trail, which uh, takes advantage of our 191 kilometres of coastline. The launch point at Lauderdale will be one of 10 built for people to access the trail. Placed third and fourth on the TSL ladder, Clarence and Kingborough will face off in the Godomsky Rewalt Trophy. It's the headline clash of a bumper weekend of local footy, which will also see regional competitions going head to head. Mere percentage separates the Roos and Tigers for third place on the TSL ladder. Clarence coach Jeremy Webberley says they're pretty evenly matched on the field too. He's expecting a tough challenge from the Tigers midfield. They're playing some fantastic footy and, and they're young and energetic and um, they're extremely similar to you know, the three or four guys that rotate through um, our midfield. The two sides to play for the Godomsky Rewalt Trophy, supporting research into bone marrow failure syndrome. The Godomsky family is a you know, pretty big part of our club. Um, it's a great occasion. It's something that you know we look forward to every year. Lauderdale are chasing their second win of the season at North Hobart Oval. We haven't been able to string four quarters of footy together over the last couple of weeks. We've been blown away in a quarter of footy and then played some OK footy after that. The Women's Statewide All-Stars Series continues this week, with the SFL hosting the NTFA at North Hobart Oval, a clash between under-20 squads to raise the curtain. Uh, I think our intensity is going to have to be there against the girls. They're going to come out firing. Both coaches happy with the depth across their respective competitions. We've got a representation from every club in the competition, so we were pretty keen on doing that um, to make sure every club's got someone there. NTFA clubs are getting behind the inaugural Speak Up Stay Chatty Shorts Day. What we want people to do is to wear shorts and to brave the cold, brave the conversations. The organisation has also been delivering talks to clubs, encouraging conversation around mental health. It was just a massive learning curve for us, more so, um, you know, not, not so much about your own problems, but how to help your mates out as well. Josh Duggan, 7 Tasmania News. Tasmanian boxers will step into the ring for a tournament at the Launceston PCYC in Newstead tomorrow night. And what organiser Graham George hopes will become an annual event, athletes aged from 10 to 40 will strap on the gloves, including mother of two, Claire Matern, whose young daughter is a big fan. Sort of slows it down a little bit. Life gets very busy, but no, happy to be back and she likes to come along to training. My brother is a professional boxer. He been a lot of uh, gold medal back in Iran, so he, like, I'm, I'm learning from him. 14 bouts are scheduled tomorrow night. And there's enormous excitement for this weekend's game between the Bombers and the Hawks. So tonight's Friday flashback is on the last time Essendon played in Tasmania in 1997. The Hydro Challenge, a practice match ahead of the Ansett Cup, saw the likes of Matthew Lloyd grace North Hobart Oval against the Sydney Swans. The first Hydro Challenge between Carlton and Geelong in 1996 drew in an astonishing 19,000 fans. So it made sense to give it another go with Essendon and Sydney the following year. We aim to bring a very strong competitive team down. And they did, with a young Matthew Lloyd in just his third season booting the first of the game. Small forward Craig O'Brien was in on the action, banging this one home from 50. The legion of local fans cheered on Olveston's Ryan O'Connor. The burly forward would receive a rapturous reception. Simon Garlick had big shoes to fill with the absence of Tony Lockett, but was fine in front of goal. Chris Danaher likewise. The Bombers seemed to have the upper hand. But when the rain started falling, the Swans started lifting, bursting to a two-goal lead with just five minutes to go. The Dons were having none of it, though, charging back with late goals to 
win by 11 points. That night's news coverage ending with a familiar sentiment. Over 15,500 Tasmanian fans seeing a thrilling match and once more displaying the state's passion for football and its desire for its own AFL team. Good evening. Showers eased about the east and south during the morning. Partly cloudy conditions elsewhere. 14 in Hobart today. Launceston 15. Burnie 17 while Devonport reached 16. 17 the state's top at Wynyard. Smithton and King Island 16. Lowhead, Bushy Park, Scottsdale and Strawn all 15. 14 at St Helens and the Friendly Beaches. A top of 7 for Liawini today. Cloud over the south, east and central parts with mostly clear skies for the northwest. Cloud over southeastern Australia today, a band of high cloud over northern western Australia, the remainder mostly clear. Tomorrow's chart now on high over South Australia will extend a ridge over most of the country. A low sits over the Tasman Sea with a cold front approaching WA. On the water and southeasterly winds at 10 to 20 knots, swells below a metre in the north up to three metres elsewhere. A strong wind warning remains from the northern tip of Flinders Island to St Helens Point. A moderate flood warning for the Macquarie and South Esk rivers. A, a flood warning rather for the Coal River. A minor flood warning for the Jordan River and a flood watch remains in place for the eastern half of the state. Hobart a shower and 13 tomorrow, 11 for Medina. Oatlands fine with a top of 10 degrees. Launceston fine and 15, a mostly sunny day for Devonport. Liawini 1 overnight up to 7 degrees. Early fog for Burnie and 14, a fine day for Marawar and Strawn, 13. In the east, St Helens and Swansea a shower and 14, Orford fine and 13. Looking ahead to Sunday now, fine day, possible showers about the west, fine again on Monday, possible showers once again for the west, and Tuesday, possible light showers for the northwest this time, but a fine day elsewhere. Perth tomorrow fine and 19, Adelaide 16, Melbourne 15, 13 in Canberra, showers and wind for Sydney 16, a sunny day for Brisbane 20 degrees. And it's 12 degrees in Hobart right now, 12 also in Launceston and Devonport, mostly clear and 10. And Kim Murph will be back on Monday and he'll be grumpy. <laughs> You're right, wish me luck. Thanks Laura.